Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Our guest today is the author of a recently published book, Corruption and Hypocrisy in Malay Muslim Politics, The Urgency of Moral Ethical Transformation. Emeritus Professor Tan Sri Muhammad Kamal Hassan joins us today. He, in uh, 1999, was appointed the third rector of uh, International Islamic University, Malaysia IIUM, and he was the first person to hold the Malaysia Chair for Islam in Southeast Asia at the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Professor Kamal, welcome to the show. It's good of you to join us. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Okay, I'm going to jump right into the book um, because in it you wrote, and if I may quote it, uh, political corruption and hypocrisy in Malay Muslim political culture and behavior are currently at levels, at the lowest levels in Malaysian history, end quote. And um, you, you've said that this is, for you, the most frustrating phenomenon as a citizen. I'm wondering whether you can begin our conversation today by elaborating on the impetus um, for you to write and to publish this book now. Thank you very much, um, Melissa, and also Sharat. Uh, for giving me the honor to be um, interviewed and um, consider this uh, program. Uh, this is the first time for me. And uh, also I wish uh, to thank um, uh, Astro Awani for um, deciding to also highlight uh, that, that my book, which has uh, just come out. Now, um, as, as you rightly said, that um, uh, one of the reasons why I decided uh, to write was that at the age of um, uh, 79 and going into 80, uh, I have never written anything about politics in Malaysia. And I feel that my time is about to, to end in this world. <laughs> and uh, I may have to return to Allah soon. Uh, uh, but uh, the political scenario is most frustrating, especially, uh, you know, I've been observing the political developments in the country for the last seven decades. And, um, and uh, I feel that uh, things are getting worse. And, and this is really uh, very, very um, uh, frustrating, uh, very disgusting at times. Uh, and appalling as well. And, um, uh, and then I realized I am not the only person. There have been uh, many other uh, intellectuals and intelligentsia, uh, Muslims as well as non-Muslims, uh, expressing uh, their uh, dismay uh, with the corruption and the hypocrisy uh, in, in politics. And I, of course, I decided to focus on the Malay uh, politics because I, I don't know much about uh, about the non-Malay politics. So um, th that that is one factor. The I mean the the age factor, and the second is is that um, uh, the phenomenon uh, is to me um, so well entrenched. It is it has become uh, uh, cancerous. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, it is at the uh, terminal stage. And so I thought that I have to uh, do something, at least theoretically, uh, to bring about uh, a thorough, a complete transformation of the political culture of, of Malay politics. So that basically those are the two uh, factors which uh, have led me to the writing of this first ever book written by, by me on uh, uh, Malay politics. Uh, Professor Kamal, um, as you rightly point out, corruption and hypocrisy are not um, uh, the monopoly of Malay politicians or Malay society. Uh, this is a worldwide phenomenon, but and in this country also. But I, I wonder if the salience of addressing the Malay polity Malay society in your book comes from the fact that there is um, an entrenched view that Malay politics and society must dominate the federation, that Malay society and culture, its language, its religion is in fact uh, core to the identity of the nation. And therefore, uh, 
a transformation of Malay society might lead to a larger transformation. Is that in many ways part of the problem? The Ketuanan Melayu is part of the, of the corrupting influence of modern Malaysia. Yes, I think I would agree with you, uh, Sharad. In fact, um, this is also uh, part of the uh, problem of uh, Malay nationalism uh, and, um, and the expectations of, of uh, Malay nationalists ever since uh, they came into power uh, with a certain agenda uh, which uh, was meant to uplift uh, the economic position of the Malays. But uh, they, uh, I think they failed to manage the post-independence uh, political developments uh, with, the, uh, with the big uh, economic transformation, the, uh, the new economic uh, policy uh, privilege uh, uh, for, the, for the Malays and, and so on. And uh, without the uh, restraining force of, of ethics and, and, uh, and sound religious uh, values, uh, Malay leaders became more corrupt, and then with the uh, with the development of patronage politics, I think patronage politics is one of the greatest uh, factors that led to this entrenched uh, culture of of corruption. Right. Well, I, I I think it's really interesting because you know one of the things you brought in the book was um, political. Uh, corruption and bribery are used in the name of preserving of a demi bangsa agama dan negara, right? Used for the preservation of uh, an ethnic community's interest. And I just wonder, um, how do we best understand this? The Machiavellian doctrine of, of the, the ends justifies the means because um, as you wrote, to quote you, the stakes are too high to bother uh, thinking about upholding the principles of integrity, ethics, or even legality. Yes, I think um, uh, th this happens because uh, at some point in the development of the nationalist political thought, Malay nationalist political thought, uh, there is a disconnect between uh, political goals and uh, religious and ethical values. So all those uh, demi bangsa, demi negara and all that are being used to justify certain actions which uh, favour you know, uh, the Malays and, um, and, and the re religion was, uh, was not really regarded highly by the Malay nationalists. Uh, bear in mind, uh, Melissa, the Malay nationalists were largely secular oriented, westernized elites, uh, some of them with royal background, but highly anglicized, you know. And so this, um, uh, this group of Malay nationalists um, inherited the independence from the British, but uh, the, the model that they were following were in fact indirectly was a British model, separation of religion from, uh, from politics uh, and, um, and so on. So I think uh, uh, that has led to this um, uh, crisis that um, we are now witnessing. Professor, I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, that you are a student of William Roth, the author of the ah. Origins of Malay Nationalism. Yeah, of course. Uh, how do you know that, Sharad? <laughs> okay, I, little bird told me. Uh, oh. I, let me just put, it this to, uh, put this to you, though. Uh, yes, uh, you I, know, I remember, I remember uh, you know, uh, Bill Roth very fondly, uh, he and his wife. Yeah. Uh, uh, Margaret Clark. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, so yeah. I, I want to ask you. Okay, well, I, I'd like to uh, perhaps, um, you know, focus on what you consider um, the restraining forces, right? You say nationalism, uh, they're unrestrained by religion. But we see, and I think this might be counterintuitive for a lot of our listeners, because religion has played a huge part in the legitimizing, uh, you know, structures of Malay nationalism. Uh, the iconography of Malay nationalism, and as Melissa pointed out, these slogans that uh, uh, produced uh, the vast amounts of money that's spent on building um, 
an Islamic bureaucracy, uh, the, the university that you once led, also part of this grand plan. So in what yeah. sense was religion, in fact, the handmaiden to the, cor the corrupt order that we see today? Sharad um, um, and Melissa, you have um, uh, Islam in uh, two dimensions. Um, and um, the, um, the popular Islam is what I would consider the misunderstood Islam. And this, there is Islam of the book. And I want them to go back to the book, which uh, uh, takes you away from racism, uh, ethnic consciousness and Katuanan and all that, and considers uh, the whole of humanity as uh, Bani Adam, as the sons of Adam, we are all equal before God, and that uh, the aim of, uh, of politics is not power, but to deliver, uh, uh, to take care of the welfare of the people, and that political leadership uh, is not a, um, a, um, a privilege, but a responsibility to God. Now that that dimension of Islamic worldview, I'm sorry to say, Sharad, uh, is missing. So you get the popular images of Islam, uh, what in Malay is called the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, some aspects of the Sharia. You know, these are uh, the, the observable aspects of Islam. But what is uh, the, the transcendent, the spiritual and the ethical sadly missing right uh, well uh, all over the on, world on that note about the ethical and i think it's very interesting that you almost i think you you the perspective of the book is not just about corruption which we all know about corruption it's more than just you know money changing hands and misuse of uh, interested power but you also talked about hypocrisy and I think that that is a very interesting dimension to explore in Malaysia, political deception and hypocrisy, the practice of saying one thing in public, but doing something else in private. And that happens a lot in Malaysian politics, particularly in political Islam with uh, Islamic principles used to uh, used in political rhetoric to win populist support. Is that something that you've seen being increasingly used and how do we um, as you say, reset from that political hypocrisy. Yes, uh, indeed. I, um, I, I'm, I've been, I've been observing this, this uh, double standards and speaking one thing in public and another in private, not fulfilling your promises. You know, giving all kinds of promises, but that not of all these things are aspects of hypocrisy. And, and but, uh, uh, but nationalist leaders. Uh, are used to this kind of thing because that seems to be universally uh, practiced. Um, uh, uh, political, uh, politi uh, um, uh, political scientists uh, maintain that uh, political hypocrisy is, is not something. Uh, it's not something new. It's not something that's terrible. And there are times when you are you're forced to do it. So I think our Malay nationalist leaders. Uh, have bought into the idea that that um, once you go enter politics, you can't be too straight. You cannot, you know, just uh, be too honest. You have to say some things just to please your uh, constituency or or to deceive the opponent. So both ways, you use uh, uh, hypocritical methods and hypocritical behavior. And I uh, am appalled by this uh, double standards. Again, going back to Islamic ethics. And when we talk about Islamic ethics, Melissa, we have the prophetic role model as the example to be followed. Okay? And he is truthful, honest, sincere, um, and um, um, what do you call it? Humble and working for the pleasure of God. So I would like to, uh, to, 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 to bring this idea back that, that Muslim political leaders have to really change the, uh, the end of politics, not just for power for the party or power for the, for the, for the ethnic group, but a pleasure of, of the creator. Okay, well, we'll we're going to take a quick break, Professor Kamal, but uh, let's continue this conversation in just a couple of minutes. Stay tuned to consider this. We will be right back.
Hi, thanks so much for staying with Shrad and I on Consider This. Let's continue our discussion with religious scholar, Emeritus Professor Tan Sri Muhammad Kamal Hassan, author of the recently published book, Corruption and Hypocrisy in Malay Muslim Politics, The Urgency of Moral Ethical Transformation. Now, uh, Professor Kamal, in the first part of the conversation, we talked about the first part of the, the first part of the title of the book, which is Corruption and Hypocrisy in Malay Muslim Politics. Let's move on to the transformation part, the urgency of moral ethical transformation as you put in your book. I'm just wondering, um, when you talk about the need to create a, a, a new breed of leaders who are not corrupt, where is this transformation gonna come from? I mean, but short of political will to change this really entrenched patronage politic system, uh, where is the solution? Where is the transformation gonna come from? Okay, um, what I have uh, tried to do in the book is uh, to provide uh, the paradigm of new leadership, okay, uh, which I call the uh, paradigm of uh, prophetic or uh, theocentric leadership. And uh, now, uh, the political actors will have to play their role. And I uh, did not say that all political actors are corrupt. There are some who are not corrupt. And I expect the non-corrupt uh, political actors to, to, to consider seriously uh, how to bring about this uh, paradigm shift within their own political organizations. Then there are NGOs um, which are non-partisan. Uh, I expect them also to take this up. And then there are also um, uh, universities, uh, IIUM, we have uh, other partners uh, in this uh, uh, academics who are very concerned about this. Then you have uh, youth organizations. So I expect uh, many civic uh, or civil society organizations to really get together. I'm just one lone voice, an old man, an old voice. So I expect the young people to get together, work together, or uh, work in concert so that at the end of the day, each group will be working towards the new breed of leaders uh, using the new paradigm because the, the old paradigm has failed. The old paradigm is Machiavellian. The old paradigm is, is uh, 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 what do you call it, um, is based on the, um, uh, uh, this, um, what uh, the word is, uh, you know, the, uh, sorry. I can't well, you know, I, if, I can, if I can jump in there, you know, when, when you talk yeah. about uh, a kind of Muslim leader that, you know, the, the humility, one often thinks about Nick Aziz, who was the former, you know, uh, spiritual leader of PAS and also Mantibas of Klantan. And, you know, in, in Clive Kessler's book on Klantan as a state, he begins with, I'm not trying to bribe the electorate with development. And, you know, and he says pointedly how the Klantan is rejected this moral uh, worldview, the, the view, worldview of development in exchange for, for, you know, votes and so on and so forth. But things have changed dramatically, haven't they, Professor? Past is no longer yeah. the past of Nick Aziz. It's no longer a leadership with humility. So where are the political counterpoints to the kinds of politics that you characterize, that people see uh, still entrenched in UMNO today? Well, I think when, get, when things get worse, and uh, I do not know what's going to happen in G15, but I do hope that uh, the younger generation, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the minority of, uh, of um, um, uh, Malay uh, politicians, who are very uh, concerned about ethical values and moral values, uh, not necessarily another Nick Abdul Aziz, but I, I would like to see, you know, um, more of these uh, um, new leaders, young leaders who are concerned about corruption uh, and, and integrity and they want to bring in the, uh, the, the, the model of, of uh, leaders with integrity, the new breed of, of leaders. So I think that it, I am uh, I am optimistic, but time is is you know I, I will need more time. Uh, I don't think <laughs> things can happen in, in just a matter of few years. I, I so, was just about to say I'm just wondering how quickly this transformation can happen because you talked about corruption and hypocrisy as a cancer, a, a moral decay to the point where we it's become cancerous and we really need to 
do something to address this. But again, the solutions are not easy. Superficial solutions may not work. And the kind of true transformation may take a, a very long time. Is this something that oh, we might only see generations from now, um, that they may not be short-term wins for today's Malaysian? Hopefully not gener too far away, <laughs> but uh, certainly not a matter of few years. Uh, because um, uh, you, you need, uh, at the end of the day, you need um, uh, a critical mass and not just a few individuals here and there, you know. Even we have uh, uh, the, the, the palace also addressing this issue. But I think uh, you need that, that groundswell, uh, you know, to happen. Uh, and, and that could happen, you know, uh, uh, after, say, if G15 is still bringing back the same old, old, old corrupt stuff, then I think the younger generation, uh, where are the young people? I would like them to see taking up this, this uh, ethical uh, jihad, uh, you know, to bring about uh, the, the, the change that, that uh, the Muslim community needs. So... Um, but, uh, that's why but, Professor Kamal, but is your message exclusively to the Malay Muslim of Malaysia, considering that uh, Malay Muslims uh, and Muslims in general constitute only about 60% of the population. Isn't there a need for a larger message that goes beyond the Malay Muslim community? Yeah, this is, um, of course, because I, I, I deal with the um, corruption of the Malay uh, uh, political uh, group. Um, but... Uh, uh, the message is universal, but I would I would like the Malays to take this up. Uh, and I, in, in, if you read the last uh, in in my conclusion, I talk about uh, you know uh, it is it, it would be a, a sign of stupidity to increase the number of of Malay parties. I would like to see a decrease in the number of parties, an increase in the and uh, in moral ethical consciousness, and 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 then. The new breed of leaders, uh, Sharad, uh, are, are going to be really multiracial, not monopolized by one ethnic group anymore. Uh, so I would like to see an Iban Muslim, a Kadazan Muslim, an Indian Muslim, and Chinese Muslim working together for the sake of, of Malaysia as a whole. So that, that is my vision uh, of the future, and I, I believe it is possible, but we have to go beyond this, uh, you know, the... Uh, ethnic identity politics first, but uh, as I said, I, I, I still believe there are uh, some um, uh, well-meaning, uh, sincere uh, politicians who can work together. In fact, uh, I, I, I was thinking one scenario is you have two, two parties for the Malays. One that has uh, an agenda for, uh, say, for um, one particular ethnic group, but the other one is uh, sort of a multiracial and um, a Malaysian focus and uh, uh, sharing of power. We, we already have sharing of power, but it's not really that, that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, real sharing, yeah? Uh, yeah? So we hope that in the future, we can have a real sharing of power, uh, not based on, on religion, but based on, on, on universal ethnic moral values. All right, Professor, thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. It's been a pleasure speaking to you and congratulations on the book. Hope, hopefully that it will get this conversation moving and there's some traction. It will uh, generate a new breed of, of leaders, as you uh, you've put it. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa and Sharad. That was our conversation with Emeritus Professor Tan Sri Muhammad Kamal Hassan. And that wraps up this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin signing off for the evening. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much for watching. watching. Good night.